Hello and welcome back to What If, where we take a look at the strange What If and Elseworlds stories from Marvel and DC Comics. Today we're continuing the Superman and Batman Generation series, which tells the story of the Cape Crusader and the Man of Steel if they aged in real time since their inceptions in the 40s. Or 20s, I guess. We'll get there. Anyway, we've jumped ahead another decade and now the children of Batman and Superman have stepped up, preparing to take over the roles of their parents. So let's get into it. The year is 1959. Batman aims the Whirlybat at a massive living house complete with silly legs. He notes that he is getting way too old for this kind of thing. The house has been alive for 30 minutes, but thankfully hasn't killed anyone yet. Leaping off his Whirlybat, Batman jumps on its roof, having no choice but to try and tame it like a Bronco. Minutes later, we see the police shocked at what just happened, but Batman isn't phased. He shouts for Batmite, who he knows is behind this strange crime. Yet, it is Mr. Mixie Spitlick who appears before him. You got the right idea, Batboy. Just the wrong imp, he smiles. Meanwhile, a city away, a monstrous green Superman continues to lash out in Metropolis Harbor. Luckily, Jimmy Olsen is using an old psycho helmet from Mentallo to calm the crazed Superman. As Superman starts to slow, Jimmy checks his watch, noting that the effects of the red kryptonite should be wearing off soon. As if on cue, Superman begins to shrink, returning to the regular Man of Steel. Soon after, over at the Kent residence, young Kara finally gets the attention of her mother, Lois. Lois is shocked to discover that her daughter is hovering off the floor, and realizes that her and Clark's second child has developed superpowers, since she was never exposed to gold kryptonite like Joel, their firstborn, was. Back over with Superman, Batmite suddenly appears before the Man of Steel, while in Gotham, Batman demands to know why Mr. Mixie Spitlick is annoying him instead of Superman. The two imps both explain their story to the world's finest superheroes. Okay, I'm gonna make this as simple as possible for you guys because it's kind of needlessly convoluted, but hey, we are dealing with fourth dimensional imps here. So, the two were kidnapped by a group of aliens. These beings came from a peaceful world that was enslaved by a higher power. Classic stuff here. Their uprising wanted a champion to herald in their freedom, so they scraped together a starship and set out to find one. Oh, and they chose Earth because they saw some footage of the original Justice League from the 40s. Unfortunately though, when they arrived on Earth, they realized they only had enough fuel to transport one more person back to their planet. I guess two would go over the weight limit? I'm no rocket scientist. Anyway, the aliens decided that they would have the imps test both Batman and Superman so they could decide which is the strongest hero to help free their world. To make the test impartial, however, the aliens commanded the imps to fight the opposite heroes. So that's why this imp nonsense is happening. Hopefully that made sense. Batmite finishes up his explanation with a big grin, but Superman isn't convinced, telling the little imp the flaw in their plan. What if Batman and I don't want to be tested? He asks. Batmite laughs and tells the Man of Steel that he doesn't have a choice, and suddenly the movie billboard behind Superman comes to life and the monster begins to attack the city. Back at the Kent apartment, Lois finally finds what she is looking for. She pulls out a special red necklace and gives it to her daughter. Kara puts the necklace on and lands back on the ground. Lois wore this necklace while pregnant to prevent Kara from developing powers while in the womb. It isn't kryptonite though, it simply mimics red sun radiation like that of Krypton's atmosphere, negating the powers that yellow sun gives the beings. Kara runs off, thanking her mother and agreeing not to tell anyone why she wears the necklace. Meanwhile, over in the Batcave, Alfred comes downstairs to discover young Master Bruce Jr. working out in his Robin costume. I just thought I'd try it on for size. After all, next year I'll be the same age Uncle Dick was when he became Robin, young Bruce explains. But Alfred explains that his mother wouldn't like that at all. The two are interrupted with a surprise visit from Dick Grayson. Dick decided to come visit from his law firm in New York, since the DA's office was having some downtime. Dick greets them both, asking where Bruce is. Back over with said Bruce, he is dealing with the giant robot that Mr. Mixie Spitlick has created. The robot is tearing through the city blocks. Mr. Mixie Spitlick plays rough. At least Batmite thinks he's on my side. Part of the problem is that Mixie is used to dealing with Superman, so he keeps conjuring threats that require superpowers to deal with. Batman thinks to himself, I'll just have to improvise, he says as he quickly jumps on a crane, using it to smash into the robot. In Metropolis, Superman suddenly has a brilliant idea while fighting the giant movie monster. He begins to fly around the creature, creating a whirlwind and lifting it off the ground. The whirlwind heads to Gotham, where Batman is shocked to watch a giant lizard fly out and begin to fight his robot. What's going on here? Mixie demands of Batmite. My monster is fighting your monster! We'll have to think of another way to test our heroes, Batmite explains. Suddenly, a one-eyed, fire-breathing tentacle monster appears over the city. Batman tries to escape on his whirly bat, but Batmite stops him. The Dark Knight falls from his whirly bat, plummeting towards the creature below, yet Superman is there, rescuing his friend. As they try to get away, one of the massive tentacles smashes them into the earth. The two imps begin to argue over whose fault it was that their heroes were dead, but suddenly, the aliens appear before them and teleport them both to the ship. 
You have proven who is the most powerful among you. Now we will take you back to our world, they explain. Not sure why the aliens didn't just assume the fourth dimensional beings they captured were the most powerful on the planet, but hey, whatever works. Back on Earth, all of the monsters disappear as both Superman and Batman pick themselves off the ground. Batman smiles, letting Superman know it was a good thing he was able to whisper the plan into his ear with his super ventriloquism, and that he was able to dig into the Earth before the monster squished them. Yes, since the aliens were so determined to find the most powerful, who better than Mixie and Batmite? Superman smiles and nods. Meanwhile, however, in Metropolis, a young, powerless Joel Kent sits outside his family's apartment. And suddenly, Lex Luthor is there, and he has a great secret to tell. Fast forward another 10 years, 1969. The president looks out the window of the Oval Office at the group of protesters just outside the White House gates. Their signs call for the end of the war in Vietnam. Can you do something about this? He asks, turning back to the group of heroes in the room. They all agree that they could, but they won't. This war is far more complicated than good versus evil. They step outside, each member of the League leaving in their own time. Batman turns to Superman, knowing that he wants to stop this war more than anyone. Have you heard from Joel? Batman asks, but Superman shakes his head. It has been two years since his first son left to war in an attempt to prove himself as worthy. He knows he's the son of Superman, and that is a heavy burden to bear. The Kents haven't heard from him since. Batman relates to Clark. Bruce Jr. is supposed to be leaving for basic training in two days. Meanwhile, at Wayne Manor, an aging Bruce Wayne sits by the gravestone of his faithful friend and ally, Alfred Pennyworth. Suddenly, the air shimmers, and the ghost of Alfred stands before him. There you are. I was beginning to think you weren't coming, Bruce tells his friend with a smile. While Bruce has always thought of this Alfred as a hallucination, the faithful servant explains that he is still fulfilling the promise he made to the Wayne family. Alfred knows that it was hard for Bruce to pass on the mantle of Batman to Dick, but he did the right thing. The two continue to talk as Bruce fills Alfred in on what's happening. Oh, and by the way, side note here, this Alfred thing isn't ever actually explained. It's not clear if Bruce is actually talking to the ghost of Alfred, or if this is just a visual representation of his grieving process. Who knows? Anyway, back to the melodrama. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin are in the cell of an aging Joker on Rock Island, demanding to know what he knows about this new Joker Jr. that is running around the city. He's no son of mine, no matter what he says, Joker explains, telling them that he never had a son, nor did he train a protege. Over in Metropolis, Kara Kent waits outside the doctor's office while Lois Lane learns that she has cancer, with no idea how long she has left. Lois has never been one to worry, though, and resigns herself to her fate. As they get ready to leave, Kara changes into her Supergirl uniform, informing her mother that she overheard what she was saying inside. Mom, you can't just give up, she tells her but Lois doesn't want to talk about it. She just wants to go home. Switching settings once more, we're now in the jungles of Vietnam, where we find Joel Kent, now a lieutenant in the US Army. He's led his squad into the jungle, informing them that he has discovered a Viet Cong base. The men look over the hill, seeing nothing but women and children below, but Joel leads them down anyway, his mind having snapped from the rigors of war. Raving mad and preparing to open fire on the villagers, his men decide that he has gone too far and prepare to take action against him. Back inside the Batcave, Bruce stands with his son and Dick Grayson, discussing the plan. BJ believes that he should dress up as Batman by using the spare suit he has in his belt. That way, he can fool the Joker. But Dick disagrees. They must maintain the facade that he is the same Batman that Bruce was. Joker. He's definitely up to something. You're not the only one whose sixth sense has been tingling, Dick, Bruce tells them. A division of force does seem like the answer, Robin. You go back to Rock Island and see what you can shake out of the Joker's tree. I'll follow up the latest lead on Joker Jr., Dick tells his sidekick. The clues lead him to the Diamond Exchange, and Batman is quickly there, scaling the building walls. Meanwhile, Robin returns to Rock Island, but is shocked to discover that the Joker isn't there. Inside his cell, they find makeup and spirit gum for attaching a wig and beard in a hidden compartment. Robin races away, knowing that Batman is in danger. Inside the Diamond Exchange, Batman discovers a trap floor and begins to fall down a chute. Razor blades come out of the wall, cutting his body to the bone as he falls. He eventually arrives in Joker Jr.'s base of operations. The clown smiles at him. Congratulations, this must have taken years to set up, Batman tells the clown. Almost ten years, beginning with using my ill-gotten gains to create a dummy corporation to purchase the diamond exchange, Joker laughs. Batman is confused, knowing that Joker Jr. has only been active for four years. But Joker just laughs, also revealing that there were hallucinogens in the razor blades that sliced Batman's body. Dick tries to lash out, but the world begins to shift and morph around him as the drugs and blood loss take effect. The room moves again, and Batman falls into a huge meringue pie, 
The filling begins to attack his drug-addled mind, but what he doesn't see are the machine guns that begin to aim at him. Outside, Robin arrives at the scene, hearing the sound of machine gun fire from within. He races inside, but he's too late to save his mentor. As the police drag out Joker Jr., the Clown Prince laughs, revealing that he was really the aging Joker this whole time. I am the Joker, and I am the man who just killed Batman! <laughs> he laughs maniacally. The police are shocked, not believing what they heard. No, he's lying, BJ tells them, exiting the building now dressed as Batman. He carries Dick Grayson in his arms, now dressed as Robin, with his head covered. He didn't kill Batman, he killed Robin. Days later, Bruce Wayne stands on the cemetery hill, speaking to the ghost of Alfred about this tragedy. He overhears his son telling Kara that they can no longer be together, as he believes that he must dedicate his life to being Batman. But Bruce comes down to the couple, telling BJ that he can do both. He must at least try. Clark then arrives with Lois, telling young Bruce that he'll be a fine Batman. Later, when the Kent family returns home, Lois discovers a telegram on the floor of their apartment. Tears fill her eyes as her heart drops. It is with great regret that we inform you, your son Joel Perry Kent was reported killed in action. September 13th, 1969. And that is the tragedy-filled second issue of Superman and Batman Generations. I think this, like most stories told in this format, is when things really start to get in gear. We've been with this universe's version of Bruce and Clark for long enough now that they can start to deviate from the norm, which is a ton of fun as always. And it only gets more interesting from here, so stay tuned for the remaining two issues of this series and the potential, like, I think like 16 or 20 more issues in the sequels to this book. We'll see if we end up doing those, but anyway, stay tuned. We will be returning to some classic Marvel stuff shortly after we wrap up this series, so look forward to that. Don't forget to check out our Patreon as well to get early access and extra content. It helps out a ton, so yeah. Thanks for watching, see you next time.